become the regional manager out of Denver, Colorado for Arthrosurface. I've had the privilege of working on this project uh, since its inception a couple years ago with Dr. Yi as well as Lester. It kind of came about from a chance circumstance meeting between Lester and Dr. Yi uh, a little over three years ago and uh, it's kind of come full fruition. So Dr. Yi saw this as um, a gap in his patient algorithm that was not being addressed by a lot of companies or the options that were available to most surgeons were not filling the um, patient population that really wanted to stay active, which is what Arthrosurface's mantra is. So that's why, uh, in conjunction with Dr. Yi and several other surgeons around the country, Dr. Cheryl, Dr. Culp, we came out with this implant. Thus far, it's been very successful. Dr. Yi's done uh, over 10 patients with great results that he can speak about in, uh, in more detail. Uh, his background, he trained at the University of Virginia, did his fellowship and residency out of New Mexico, was a system professor there, and has been one of the busiest hand surgeons in Colorado for the past uh, almost decade. Features one of his 5280s top hand surgeons um, in the state of Colorado. So um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Yi. Well, thanks for having me um, tonight. Um, I know it's kind of late in the day. But, but again, I'm pretty passionate about this. I think this works. Uh, I'm very happy that um, this came, uh, finally came to market and, uh, and others get to, um, to use what I, I think is, a, is just a phenomenal option. Actually, what's interesting is that back in about 2002, 2003, when Arthrosurface was first starting, um, one of the sales reps here showed me this. I said, hey, why don't you guys just make, uh, make a little piece for the capitate? So I actually ended up calling Arthrosurface, and they said, no, you know, we're a kind of a small company. We just want to uh, focus on the hip and the knee right now, and and uh, we want to get that going. And then about nine years later, I ran into Lester and I said, hey, Lester, um, can you uh, can we work on this? And he said, sure. And then from the time that started, uh, from that moment, it took us about 18 months, and, you know, two and a half years later, here we are with this implant, which, again, I'm very excited um, having done, you know, about uh, um, 10 of these having a few more on the schedule and everybody is just universally as happy as can be with this. So, so I want to share some of um, the rationale behind this and um, how I think it's going to really be helpful. So um, wrist anatomy, you know, a lot of people think the wrist is just a, um, a big, um, big black box, sort of like the way I think the kidney is, like stuff goes in and stuff comes out. But if you think about the wrist, it's very unique in the fact that there's absolutely no muscles attached to any of the eight bones in the wrist. But yet you have these seven complex bones that are just kind of suspended on top of the radius and the ulna, and they all have to work without um, um, having it fall apart. And the good way to think about it is if you're trying to balance two balls on your hand and not let them fall. That's basically what the wrist is doing every day, but yet it gives you this complex motion, provides great stability, um, and um, provides an excellent platform for the hand. But just as we know about anything in life, everything, anything and everything that's really complex can fail, and when it fails, it's very hard to reconstruct it and make it back to a normal again. So some of the things that can cause wrist abnormalities, arthritis, is post-traumatic, um, things that we think about like scaphoid fractures that go untreated or scaphoid interosseous ligament tears that go untreated, rheumatoid arthritis, just osteoarthritis, just wear and tear, and then you can have bone diseases like, such as Kienbach's disease and Pricer's disease, which is um, basically um, Lunate losing his blood supply and just dying, which is Kienbach's disease, and then the same thing for unknown reasons, the scaphoid loses his blood supply and the bone starts to die. Then there's other problems like metabolic problems such as gout and pseudo gout, which causes the cartilage and the ligaments to erode um, sooner than later. So what are the current treatments of arthritis? There's really not a whole lot. Uh, proximal carpectomy has been around for a long time. People who have been doing intercarpal fusions, which was introduced by Watson back in the 70s. And then you have total wrist fusions, which also have been doing, has been um, around for a long time. And people have um, experimented with wrist arthroplasties with limited success now and uh, very limited success in the past. Here's an example of um, a complete wrist fusion. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, wrist arthroplasty just because um, um, Again, it preserves motion and preserves function. Um, the first one was um, actually 
described back in the 1890s, um, um, a German-Austrian surgeon, he just actually um, took a kid that had tuberculosis and the tuberculosis destroyed his wrist and he took a, um, a piece of ivory that he just kind of carved out and made it smooth and stuck it in his wrist. And then uh, back in the 60s, Dr. Swanson, uh, in conjunction with Dow Corning, came up with a silicone wrist arthroplasty. And uh, we all know what happens with silicone. It's just uh, basically a um, rubber stick that ends up breaking over time. And when it breaks, it causes a huge reaction to the body. Then um, when uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s, when uh, um, hip replacements were, were really big, they were taking the concept from the hip and trying to create a ball and socket joint in the wrist. And, um, to try to create a wrist replacement. Um, as you can see from these, they are pretty crude. Um, but while they were working, patients were happy. It's just that, the, um, that um, there was a lot of forces on, on these prostheses and they ended up failing. A good early results, but again, uh, major problems with loosening. And uh, I think one of the major reasons that they conclu concluded was that bone in the wrist are not as stout or strong as those in the hips, so fixation became an issue. Fixation seemed to be more of an issue in the, um, in the distal aspect or in the hand portion rather than the radius. And um, the uh, first design, which is a biaxial design, they were trying to recreate some of the, uh, the motions in the wrist. Again, if you could take your wrist and um, you can circumduct it and make a circle out of it. And also, um, uh, when you throw darts, it's more of a diagonal motion in your wrist, which is actually very complex to uh, reproduce. But they were trying to reproduce that with this um, dual axle um, uh, or axis of rotation design. And um, they never quite got the uh, motion right because all these ended up with about half of your normal motion. And they had um, significant problems with the distal component on the third metacarpal uh, loosening. So the current design, I think, which is um, the, uh, the Integra and the SBI, they have the um, universal motion design. And basically, it's just a modern version of the ball and socket joint that I showed you a few slides ago. But it's not quite as constrained. As you can see, a couple of the things that they do is that the stem that goes into the hand is not as long. And what they've learned is that the longer you make the um, stem that go into the hand, um, mainly the third metacarpal, it's like a seesaw. The further away you're from the center of axis, there's more, um, more movement. And so that was causing like a windshield wiper effect, causing it to come loose in the third metacarpal. So they added more areas of um, fixation by adding the two other screws with the um, pin that's going down toward the third metacarpal. And they've had less problems with the loosening. Uh, but again, the big thing with this is that you resect a lot of bone. You can see how prominent that prosthesis is and how much bone that they have to remove. Again, they've had limited success. They claim about an 80 percent eight-year survival ship, but they still don't recommend it on young active patients. And the main reason is that if this prosthesis fails, you just don't have, um, have much bone to work with. So even trying to do a fusion after you take this prosthesis out it becomes very um, difficult. So this is basically your only chance to get the patient better. And if this fails, you're um, kind of in a tough position. So 85% good to excellent results in seven years. Again, not recommended for younger active patients. So like I spoke about earlier, what are the limitations of current designs? Large bone resection makes future reconstruction or fusions um, difficult. You um, still only have about 50% of your normal motion at best case. And uh, with the wrist arthroplasty, even with a biaxial design, it's hard to recreate that diagonal motion of the wrist. And again, long-term durability is a big problem. So other options um, where you have limited arthritis, which is confined to the carpal bones, which are the um, seven bones in the wrist, and not confined to the radius, then um, we can start doing some um, limited um, fusions. And here's an example of a scaphoid excision four corner fusion. Basically, you take the scaphoid out. That's that empty space you see on the right side below the thumb. And then the other four bones, which is the um, lunate, hamate, triquitrum, and the capitate. You take those four bones and you do a fusion, make them all into one bone. Um, this is a good operation. It's been around for uh, 40 years, 45 years, but it's it's one of the operations that I hate doing. I feel like I'm a pretty 
pretty good technician, but every time I see a patient that requires a surgery, I try to talk him out of surgery because I just do not, I just don't like doing it. It's technically very difficult. The patients are in a cast for um, four, five, six months waiting for these bones to heal, and then afterwards, they're just stiff, and uh, patients regret having it done uh, while they're going through the healing process. But when you get a, um, a six months to a year out, they end up with about the same amount of motion as a wrist fusion, which is about 50% of your normal motion. And here's an example of one of my patients. Uh, if you look at the um, slide on the left, you can't you can't hardly even make out the bones because the um, destruction is so bad. Um, and this was a patient back in May. I was trying to get a prototype arthrosurface to put in her, but um, there wasn't one available, so I was forced to do a scaphoid excision for a corner fusion. And um, I hated this operation. It took a long time. The patient finally ended up healing. Um, I did this operation probably about. Um, yeah, I think last May, and I still, I'm still seeing her in my office just because she's still having some pain and stiffness with her hand. So what are some of the problems with the four-corner fusion? Even though you do the four-corner fusion, about one and a half percent of them um, over the five to seven years develop arthritis. Um, proximal carpectomy has almost a four percent uh, chance of getting uh, developing arthritis. We really haven't talked about proximal carpectomies as much, but we will a little bit later. People can get um, CRPS um, or RSD um, infections with um, both scaphoid excision, four corner fusion, and uh, proximal carpectomy, which runs about half a percent. And then four corner fusion has about a 5.5% uh, uh, rate of non union and is significantly higher on smokers. Um, the dorsal impingement is um, what I um, refer to when it's technically hard to do because the lunate bone is really um, deformed and as well as the other bones in that area as shown by the previous slide and trying to get those bones to line up perfectly um, is real difficult and when you get dorsal impingement people actually can't get any extension. Um, hardware problems constitute about 3% of the um, problems and then um, about 3% of the people end up with a total wrist fusion five to seven years down the road. So um, even though it's a um, good operation, technically very difficult, um, it's not perfect. So now proximal carpectomies. Um, this is what's uh, done when you, uh, when you remove the scaphoid, lunate, and the triquetrum and allow the shape of the capitate to fit into the lunate fossa. So the left slide shows the scape for lunate and ligament tear and um, uh, you can see the arthritis between the scaphoid and the radius on the left and uh, but there's no arthritis on the lunate fossa. The interesting thing is when, our, when the patterns of arthritis progresses even with the previous um, x-rays that I showed the lunate fossa is usually uh, pretty well preserved. So the scaphoid can fit right into the, excuse me, the capitate can fit right into the um, lunate fossa. So this has about a good five, uh, five to ten year result, 50% uh, of normal motion. Technically very easy to do. Um, any hand surgeon that does a lot, uh, mm -hmm. um, has any significant volume will do, uh, will do this, um, or can do the surgery in about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and um, since you're not waiting for anything to heal, you just have to wait for the skin and the and the wrist swelling to go down and you can start moving them probably in about three or four weeks. However, the capitate and the um, does not fit in the lunate fossa perfectly and so there's a lot of sliding around instead of just rotation and this wears out um, over time and in fact um, some papers have come out and it's now understood that if you do this operation on patients under 40 they will have problems within about 10 years. So here's um, Here's a patient, uh, um, I think this is a patient of mine. Um, you can see the scaphoid ligament tear just like the previous slide, um, but this is the left hand instead of the right hand. I did a proximal carpectomy. She was very happy. Um, three months later, I let her um, start to play golf. And, um, but I started to notice that something was a little bit unusual. If you look at the x ray on the left, there's a uh, uh, where the capitate is in the lunate fossa, you can see that there's a little less space between the uh, uh, in between the bones. As you, I went back to the previous one, you can easily delineate the capitate and the lunate, wearing out a little bit more. And then basically within nine months.
uh, she was basically bone on bone. Um, and this is also another problem with the um, uh, uh, proximal carpectomy in the, in the fact that the shape of the capitate, again, does not fit in to the lunate fossa very well. And this is, uh, this is actually a different patient um, that you can see that 10 years out, and now they have arthritis between the capitate and the um, radius. So um, again, to reiterate the problems with the proximal carpectomy, the shape of the capitate um, does not fit into the fit into the lunate fossa very well, and also, um, as in this case, um, there's arthritis between the capitate um, and the lunate, which is stage three of the SLAC wrist, and um, proximal carpectomy cannot be done for this. So this is where the arthrosurface uh, um, hemicap comes in, in the fact that um, uh, when, uh, when we decided to design this, I said it would be really nice to have the capitate have the shape of the lunate so it fits in there perfectly. So currently the capitate has about a 50% um, of the um, lunate fossa is covered by the capitate and 37% on the, on the AP view and 57% on the um, lateral view. But now with the new shape, um, it mimics the shape of the lunate fossa very well and is very congruent. The other thing that um, I didn't talk about earlier is that when, uh, when you do a proximal carpectomy, you're actually making your wrist a little bit shorter. And when you make a little, um, the, uh, uh, the wrist shorter, then that causes um, some potential with weakness. And if you think about a rubber band, if you stretch it real tight, which means you're pulling it apart, which means um, the distance between is further or longer, then there's more tension on the rubber band. But if you shorten it, there's less tension on the rubber band. And if you think about a muscle being like a rubber band, then by having, a, um, um, having the wrist be shorter, the muscle can't generate as much tension or power. That's why proximal carpectomies usually only have about 60 to 70 percent of the normal strength. So um, here's an example of the um, hemicapitate. Um, the nice thing about it is that, um, as you guys all know, the, um, the arthrosurface screw just has a very good um, bond with the bone. It has longevity in the second medic, uh, in the toe. It la you know, eight-year survival rate is um, almost 90 percent. So, so uh, one of the issues about the loosening is um, is um, addressed just with the inherent instability of the um, arthrosurface screw. Uh, but you can see on this view that the um, the hemicap just fits in that lunate fossa perfectly. So what are the um, official wrist ind um, indications for, for the um, arthrosurface um, hemicapitate? So basically anyone that's got a lot of pain, um, it, that can be from degenerative arthritis, osteo, post-traumatic, or avascular necrosis. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is an indication, but you have to be careful with rheumatoid arthritis because some patients with rheumatoid arthritis will have a lot of soft tissue destruction. If they have a lot of soft tissue destruction, um, I would hold off on it, but some rheumatoid uh, patients can have just bone destruction without a lot of ligament injuries. Um, this can be done um, for failed proximal carpectomies and um, for failed um, other uh, reconstructions for escape for lunate ligament reconstruction. Um, and then it can be done for um, fractures of the um, Carpal bones, there's uh, people with scaphoid perilunate fractures will actually fracture their um, um, capitate, and this can be used for, for something like that. So the main ind indications to the proximal carpectomy is basically um, stage two, um, arthritis of the wrist, which is uh, between the radius and the scaphoid, and the head of the capitate has normal cartilage. Um, and the same thing for the um, scaphoid non-union, and this can also be done for Kienbach's disease. However, it cannot be done for any um, cases where the um, capitate has any arthritic changes or any erosions, which would make it a, a stage three slack wrist. This can be done um, also for failed um, PRC. And um, and again, anytime there's an indication for a scaphoid excision, four corner fusion. Um, I feel like 
that should be replaced uh, with this procedure. So what are the advantages? Uh, it's pretty nice in the fact that it's very um, easy. So it's um, simpler than a, um, a four-corner fusion. It increases your carpal height, which in theory will allow you to have better grip strength. Um, improves the congruence with the lunate fossa, so hopefully this may even last longer than um, a proximal carpectomy because the congruency of the joint is there. Um, and then um, a good way to present this to a surgeon is that, hey, anytime you're going in there for a proximal carpectomy, um, just have this available because if you find any cartilage abnormality, putting this in um, will make it so you don't have to do a four-corner fusion, which is an operation, again, that I think universally most hand surgeons do not like to do. And I guess the other thing also is that um, most um, general ortho there's a lot of general orthopedists who will actually do proximal carpectomies, but they will not do four-corner fusions just for that technical um, difficulty. So, um, so again, if you're talking to a general orthopedist, it may actually be an easier sell than to a, um, to a hand surgeon. So uh, then the uh, surgical technique, um, dorsal incision, uh, this is pretty standard. Um, I usually do what's called uh, PI endorectomy. The, there's a nerve under in the fourth dorsal compartment in the back of the wrist, which is called the posterior neurosis nerve. And I go ahead and remove that so to hopefully help with some of the pain. And I do a dorsal capsular um, ligament sparing incision, um, perform a proximal carpectomy, do a partial radial silorectomy and preserve the radial scape for capitate ligament. The example on the right, um, you can see the cartilage um, eroded off the capitate. So that's a, a complete um, contraindication for proximal carpectomy. So the uh, so this uh, uh, patient ended up with a um, um, hemicap. So after proximal carpectomy and the radio um, this once you get this wire and the operation is done, so basically on the on PA view, make sure it's right in the middle, and on the lateral view that it goes right um, in the middle of the capitate. This can be tricky a little bit in the fact that the capitate is not lined up perfectly with the third metacarpal, so there's a little angle that um, you have to aim dorsally. And then, um, and after you get the guide pin in, it's just like doing the toe. You do, the, you use a step drill, tap. I really recommend that when you tap, you um, um, stress the importance of the AO technique. Um, a, a turn forward and a half a turn back, turn forward and half a turn back to clear the um, threads because one thing you don't want to do is uh, um, break this bone. So put the screw in, ream it. Um, we ream it twice, um, once on the um, proximal portion, once on the dorsal side for the um, dorsal um, camphor cut, and then um, measure the um, lunate fossa, um, and then put in the trial. So again, make sure that the guide pin is the central axis of the capitate, not the third metacarpal. And um, postoperatively, it's pretty easy. Um, splint for about 10 days when the swelling goes down, cast for three weeks, removable brace to work on range of motion. Um, I've been letting patients wait bear around the six to eight week mark now as I've gotten a little bit more aggressive with, um, um, with my patients. And, um, and I'll, let start, I'll, I'll let them start hitting golf balls around the three month mark off of a tee. And um, as they feel better, they can start hitting golf balls off the ground. And um, absolutely no restrictions by six months. So what should um, I guess uh, this is a question better for um, for you guys. So what should you guys be telling the um, uh, telling the doctors? I think orthopedic surgeons and hand surgeons would be a great market for this. Um, it's just again very unique in the fact that everybody knows what the proximal carpectomy is, but if you uh, but um, they everyone knows that it's it's an easy operation. Um, but again, they, they'll bring up the point about how it's a sloppy fit at the, um, and um, it may break down. Um, having this in there will create a congruent um, uh, contact with the lunate fossa that I think in the long run that it may end up doing uh, better than the proximal, proximal carpectomy. I think only time will, time will um, show, show this. And um, have them do some saw bones. Um, and um, we wrote an expert opinion paper, and I think it's, um, it covers a lot of the points that we've talked about. 
and that also has some pre and post app X rays. So um, these are the questions they're going to ask you. So what's the longevity? Because um, I didn't know this until I um, until recently is that the, in the toe almost 90% survivorship at five years, and that's it. Any questions? The other thing also is that there is actually a lot of forces across the wrist. If you actually take, um, if you grip something with 10 pounds of force, the way, it's so basically if you get a grip meter and you squeeze 10 pounds, the way the forces are coupled, that turns out to be almost 130 pounds, 130 pounds of force across your wrist, which, huh. is, which is quite a bit. But the other thing also is that if um, what I've been telling um people about the melalon cartilage is that it's kind of analogous to the radial head. The radial head itself, I mean you do it for fractures, we put it in all the time. And I've got patients out there that's got eight, nine, ten years um, with their radial head in. And this was back um, you know, 10, 15 years ago when you know they were advocating you should overstuff the joint. So that so I was putting implants implants that were too big and cramming it in there to um, provide stability for the elbow and even those patients are still doing fine right. and um, I just had a lady come in um, come in about six months ago I did her surgery in 2001 she fell off a horse and broke it and I put an overstuffed right medical radial head in there because that's what we're supposed to do at the time and she's got a little bit of resistance around the stem. But she has absolutely no pain in her elbow at all, and um, and I asked her if she can do a push up, and she had no pain. So I think the metal and cartilage, yeah, I, some people may have problems, but overall, I think people do do well with those. Is there an acceptable amount of leaving the laser line high to not lose as much space as with a PRC? So yeah, so basically, I guess um, uh, if you leave it too proud, is it gonna? Um, basically come loose because it's going to uh, move back and forth. Uh, I think um, I think you you can leave it a little bit proud but the part comes in when you go to um, when you go to remit you just want to make sure that you have some bony contact on the other side so that you're not putting all the stress just on the screw and some of the stress will go onto the bone from the from the cap that you put in. So the key there is in the reaming. So if you're going to leave it proud, make sure you ream you don't ream too much. Um, so that it, again, that um, that you have that bony uh, buttress underneath. Any additional soft tissue procedures or balancing? No, um, I think uh, what happens is that the muscle can tighten up on its own very well, and I basically um, some people don't cast proximal carpectomies at all, but I like to cast them for about um, four weeks um, just to allow the muscles to tighten up. Uh, mus um, the flexor tendons have an excursion of almost uh, like 28 to 30 millimeters or so, so they'll be able to tighten up that six or seven millimeters pretty, pretty easily. But I also do recommend that um, that you get um, you get post-op X-rays with the splint on because when these patients um, are asleep, they have no muscle tone, so that the the joint is somewhat unstable. So after you put the splint on, as soon as they wake up and make a fist, um, that implant is stable, but until they wake up, I think some uh, precaution needs to be taken and and um, make sure that the um, uh, post-splint x-ray shows that the, um, the implant is reduced. Size loose or tight if undecided? I guess that refers to the sizing. So there's basically two different um, sizes for the head of the capitate, um, and then there's um, the different radiuses for the, um, for the lunate. Um, that you can measure because we measure the lunate fossa on the PA and the and the um, in the um, lateral um, lateral planes, and I think for the uh, the radius of curvature, when in uh, when in doubt, if it falls between two, go with the bigger one. But the screw um, sizes um, the cap that goes onto the um, the capitate. When in doubt, go smaller, if that makes sense. So the screw um, the um, the head size. Um, when in doubt, go smaller, and then the radius curvature, when in doubt, go bigger. Is grip strength loss in PRC permanent, or does strength improve over time? If so, how much time? So um, usually by about six months to a year, the, um, the grip strength for the PRC is as strong as it's going to get. And, um, and all the studies show that people end up only with about 60 to 70 percent of the grip strength after a proximal carpectomy. Again, the big thing with that is that you're shortening the 
um, the carpal bones so that the muscles don't have as much tension anymore because all the muscle um, muscles are shorter too. So you have more slack in your rubber band instead of um, pulling it further apart to have a, um, to take the slack out. So I think that's what's the inherent loss with the um, proximal carpectomy. You will lose some strength with the um, with the um, the uh, hemicapitate too, but you won't lose as much because you'll be able to maintain a little bit more of that uh, the length of your um, carpal bones. Could someone mountain bike with this? Um, it depends on uh, whether what kind of mountain biking they do, but you know, like anything with um, mountain biking, you know, if you fall hard enough off your mountain bike you can break your wrist and if you fall hard enough to break your wrist you can break your break the plant so just like I think my um, uh, our joint partners say hey if you want to go skiing after your knee or your hip replacement yes you can go on the powder day and do groomers but I wouldn't be hitting bumps all day or going in the terrain park and jumping so I think uh, the same kind of precautions could be taken with mountain biking yes I can go do that but I don't think I would um, take a a downhill bike and go up the lift of veil and come down at 30 miles an hour. So, um, so again, you just have to remember that it's it'll never be more durable than your original wrist that you can break when you go mountain biking. But unfortunately, the consequences of breaking, um, uh, falling and breaking your wrist with the implant in is going to be a lot greater. Right. And then uh, one last question in that case, is there anything you could do splint-wise if they were going to mount a bike that would protect it more? Is there something they could wear? You know, um, I do have, because um, I, I have a lot of motocross riders and uh, mountain bikers and, and skiers, and, um, and I do um, uh, put them in a brace. Um, it's a company called All Sports Dynamics, and what they do is they make an articulated wrist brace. So it, it'll allow you to flex and extend and radially on or deviate your wrist, and they have different pads in there so you can limit your range of motion. So I actually have this girl who's a, a professional mountain biker, and I've repaired her skate from Nate and segment twice. Um, the first time I fixed it, I told her not to go mountain biking, and um, and she did it anyway, which I knew she was going to, but then we came up with a comment, and I fixed it again that, I um I ordered this brace for her, so it's made so that her wrist can bend to about 20 degrees, and it and then it stops, so it can't bend back any further. Mm -hmm. And something like that could be um, uh, beneficial to um, so has this that wants to have that extra precaution, but wants to have the range of motion to be able to mountain bike or go snowboarding or skiing and things like that. 